Why should we go to Enceladus? We should go to Enceladus because it's the one place that we really know has a habitable environment. Everything that you need to know to determine whether something is habitable, liquid water, organics, energy sources, salts, we, we know it's there. And is it better than Europa? Yeah, we don't know whether there are organic molecules in the ocean of Europa. We don't know that. Uh, we suspect that it's salty water and we have some evidence, but it's not direct evidence. And whereas we have circumstantial evidence for a hydrothermal system on Enceladus, we don't on Europa. It's interesting because Europa seemed to be like the holy grail in our solar system for a while. Yes. Uh, when it comes to life. Um, of course, we are the holy grail. <laughs> well, we know the answer, right? Yeah. Here, right? <laughs> but, uh, but Enceladus, I, 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 was, it, was it more recently that it started? Yeah, it's, Europa, it's, it's, it's the fact that it was more recent. You know, Gal look, Galileo discovered, Galileo the orbiter, not the scientist, discovered very strong evidence, almost inarguable evidence, for a liquid water ocean under Europa in the mid-1990s. Uh, it would be another almost 10 years before Cassini discovered a plume coming out of Enceladus. So that period of 10 years, we were all planning for a quick follow-up mission to Europa. I worked on an instrument, and for various reasons that had nothing to do with the science, we're still waiting for a mission to Europa. Meanwhile, Cassini arrives at Saturn discovers a plume at Enceladus, flies through the plume multiple times, discovers all this evidence for habitability. What was in the plume? So in the plume is, uh, and Cassini has sampled these directly with its mass spectrometers, uh, gaseous water, water ice, uh, salts of sodium, uh, potassium, and probably chlorine, organic molecules including methane, other hydrocarbons, benzene, some others, um, and these uh, tiny silica nanograins, really tiny nanometers, that are almost pure silica, SiO2. The only way to explain those is that they were in, dissolved in hot water, and when that hot water cooled as it traveled through the Enceladus Ocean, they precipitated out and got blown out through the, through the vents. Hmm. So that's what's there. And uh, how, how likely does that make, um, how habitable does that make Enceladus? It makes it very habitable. The basic requirements are, uh, for life as we know it, liquid water, organic molecules, uh, contact with minerals, which the salts tell us is happening because life requires the minerals, uh, gradients in temperature or in chemistry, which the silica nanograins tell us is happening at the bottom, what we call a hydrothermal system, and a, a long-lived liquid water reservoir, which Cassini also discovered through looking at the gravity, the mass distribution in Enceladus. Yeah. And what would you think, Enceladus or Europa? Oh, both. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, look, we, you know, we have to do both. And we also have to go back to Titan because of its methane seas. And, you know, all of this is eminently affordable. So. We, do, we have to do Europa through um, what's called a flagship mission because of the radiation belts. It's a very hazardous environment. Enceladus we can do with a relatively low cost mission. The materials flying out into space, the radiation environment is very benign. So we can use a simple spacecraft and just fly through the plume for Enceladus. So really and, yeah and capture a bit of that plume and yeah which is what Cassini no I, I I wouldn't take it back first that's expensive I would analyze it in place where you know we do just what Cassini did which yeah. is fly through the plume with mass spectrometers but the Cassini mass spectrometers were designed 25 years ago 20 mm -hmm. or 25 years ago so obviously instruments have improved and if we fly there today with the instruments of today we can actually detect molecules produced by life and distinguish between molecules produced by life and produced by abiotic processes. Yeah. Um, you say both, but then it should Enceladus be first? Or what's, what's the... Are they in competition with each other? They're not, actually. Okay. That's why I say both. So the way the NASA program works is that it has a program of low-cost planetary missions called Discovery. Uh, a group led by myself uh, has proposed a mission to Enceladus under that program. 
we know and NASA knows and has said so that Europa as a target requires a more expensive mission. So that's what, what is called a directed mission or a flagship mission, which would be more expensive by a factor of four. And more difficult? Uh, more difficult because of the radiation environment and even though there was a hint of a plume, it looks like that hint was actually not, uh, not a plume at all and so ultimately to sample the ocean of Europa, we'll have to land, drill, find a place where cracks open and close, do something like that. So Europa, we're still not at the stage of knowing how to sample the ocean. We have to go back there just to determine how to sample it. And in the case of Enceladus, we know. In the case of Enceladus? We do. It's the plume. I mean, it's, fr it's free samples, right? Yeah. Enceladus is sitting there if there's light, handing out free samples. The, well. I mean, the, the, bi the biological molecules that are produced by life, the evidence for life, will be in the plume. In the that's plume. right. Yeah. And in case of Europa, I believe the mission um, that's now being proposed is just, like you said, it's just going there to figure out how we're going to do it. Right. It's not that's really right. looking for it. Right. And we've got to do that. I mean, we, I, I proposed an instrument for a Europa mission in 1999 whose goal was to do exactly what the Europa mission of today is going to do. And we have, you know, there's a long history. We've fooled around with Europa missions. It's time to just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, when will that happen? Um, so there is actually the, the preliminary studies are being done and uh, the intent would be to launch something in the early 2020s. Why then? Um, why, not, why not sooner? <laughs> it just take, For a flagship mission it takes five to seven years to, to develop, like Cassini. Cassini took seven years. So it's 2015, so 2021 or 2022. It would arrive in the mid-2020s, and uh, it would actually arrive, even though we would launch Enceladus first, if we are selected for discovery, we would launch in 2020. It takes a long time to get to Saturn, so we would arrive at the end of the decade of the 2020s. We'd arrive in 2030. For the, Enceladus. For Enceladus. The Europa mission will already have happened by then. Oh, wow. Good. Tell me about the life finder. So the Enceladus Life Finder mission, uh, we would launch a spacecraft to Saturn. It would go into orbit around Saturn, just the way that Cassini did in 2004. It would um, set up a series of flybys with Enceladus by using the gravity of Titan. And we would fly through the plume of Enceladus 10 times, 10 orbits, sampling the material every time with two kinds of mass spectrometers. These are devices that essentially sniff or they taste the gas and the ice to determine the composition. And uh, they would, with uh, that material, determine whether biological processes are going on, that is life, determine the details of how habitable, what is the acidity, what is the oxidation state, what is the temperature of the interior ocean, all from this plume, and also tell us something about how Enceladus formed, which planetary scientists want to know. But the, the key goal is to find or to look for and identify molecules that are being produced by biology. How do you find them? I mean, so we have, th we have three tests, um, and they have to do with some very fundamental things about the way life behaves. So remember, it's life that exists in liquid water. Um, amino acids work extremely well in liquid water and they are everywhere. They're in meteorites, they're in interstellar space. They form very easily. But amino acids that are produced by chemistry without life have a very specific pattern. The molecules, the amino acids that are the easiest to form are the most abundant ones. Simple, dumb thermodynamics. Life doesn't work that way. It couldn't work if it just used the most common, simplest amino acids. So it makes the more complicated ones. And that mm -hmm. pattern where the more complicated amino acids are the more abundant, that's the signpost of life. So there's a very clear distinction between what you see in meteorites and what you see in biological systems. There are hundreds of amino acids. Uh -huh. Life uses 22 of them. And when you look at, at uh, meteorites or you make amino acids in a laboratory, the most abundant amino acids that you make are the simplest ones. So, um, And what would you literally look for? You would literally look for the pattern of amino acids, the abundances. You would identify each amino acid in the plume and determine its abundance. 
The mass spectrometer can do that. It does it by looking at the, the masses and the fragmentation patterns, uh, the fragments that you actually uh, make as these molecules pass into the, uh, into the mass spectrometers. Could, could you specifically say, oh, it's that amino acid that we found? Well, yeah. I mean, for example, if you were to find there, the two simplest amino acids are glycine and alanine. If they turn out to dominate over every other type of amino acid, then it's not a biological system. It's an abiotic system. So that's the signature, okay? If you find that other amino acids, uh, methionine and various others, um, threonine, for example, uh, methionine is a good example, um, the, the heavier, more complicated ones uh, dominate. That's the signature of biology. So that's the first test. The second test is that membranes in biological systems, the things that encase cells, are built out of common building blocks. There is, this is called the Lego principle by Chris McKay, uh, that the individual building blocks for the membranes are very regular. They may contain two carbon atoms each, or they may contain five carbon atoms each. But whatever they are, life uses a boxed set of those common subunits. So you would see when you analyzed, for example, fatty acids in the plume, you would see that they always had an even number of carbons, by way of example. That's the signature of life. The equivalent chemistry of building at least the molecules out of which membranes are made, if it's done abiotically, one such process is called uh, Fischer-Tropsch reaction, the chemistry uses everything. So you just get, you get three carbons, four carbons, five. It's all over the place. It's like starting with your regular Lego pieces, smashing them with a hammer, and trying to put it together using all the shards and the fragments. Very different pattern. Third test mm -hmm. is to look at the way that life uses isotopes of carbon, because life prefers to use the light isotopes of carbon. And by measuring the isotopes of the carbon in every carbon-bearing molecule in the plume, the organics, the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, will be able to tell whether there is an indication of life processing the carbon that's in the system. And could it be that um, life that's on, on Celadus or any other place besides the Earth um, uses a different isotope? Uh, there's carbon-12 and there's carbon-13, and that's it. Carbon-14 is... Um, you know, it, it's short-lived, it's radioactive. So um, it basically, uh, it, I mean, life does use it. We, we ingest carbon-14, which is made actively in the atmosphere, but in a dead organism, it decays just to nitrogen-14 in the end. Um, so yeah, there's 12 and there's 13. Um, now, would a form of life preferentially use carbon-13? Energetically, that's a lot more expensive. Huh. And so bio biological processes depend on being able to process a lot of carbon very quickly. And so we would expect that life would use the lighter isotope. Yeah. Now, the question you asked is a good one, and this is why we have three different tests for life, because it's possible there's something very odd going on, and we want to rely on multiple tests, not just on one. On the other hand, life as a system that is able to perpetuate itself must maintain a low entropy environment in its cells. That's why it expels waste all the time. And it, that's energetically really expensive. And so these patterns of life that we are looking for should be very, very common because they're part of the overall chemical philosophy, if you will, of maintaining a low entropy environment yeah. in the cells. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody else working on a similar mission, or is just is this just the uh, the the mission? If if there's a mission, it will be this one, or I, I so yes. Yeah, so within Discovery, we are the only one going to Enceladus. However, there was a proposal that has been advertised widely to bring a sample back from Enceladus, and that mission is called Life. We are Enceladus Life Finder, Elf, and the other one is Life. Life is a wonderful idea. It's more expensive. Um, we have never returned a sample from the outer solar system. Uh, sample return has a lot of technical challenges. It has some other challenges, too. For example, if you bring a sample that is biologically viable back to the Earth, 
how do you prevent it from escaping or contaminating? Um, if you actually have, are storing a sample on the way back to the earth for a long period of time, how do you prevent its contamination from stuff that you brought from the earth? In the case of our mission, we're analyzing the molecules. We bring them in, we break them up in a mass spectrometer. We analyze them immediately. Mass spectrometer has been purged. So the chance of contamination in either direction, in the case of our mission, is exceedingly small. It's basically zero. Life has the challenge of both forward and backward contamination to contend with. But if ELF comes up with positive indicators for life, I'm sure there will be a lot of excitement about ultimately bringing a sample back and perhaps studying it in more detail to be able to understand you know, what the nature of that life is. And we, we see ELF as opening the door to the exploration of the first extraterrestrial um, biota ever discovered, if it's there. If it's there, yeah. then uh, you'd be world famous for the rest of your life. Something like that. <laughs> but actually, I just want to know if there is life beyond the Earth with a separate origin. I'd like to know that. And <clears throat> you know, looking at the time it takes to explore the outer solar system, looking at the difficulties of finding it on Mars, although we might find it on Mars, I really do believe that ELF provides the best chance for that. And so that's really what I'm, I'm most, what, what really drives me for, with this mission is that it gives those of us who are middle-aged a chance to actually find out whether life really exists beyond the Earth. Today, the correct answer to the question, is there life beyond the Earth, is we don't know. We have no evidence of life on any other planet or moon in the solar system or anywhere else. And if you do, you'll probably be Nobel Prize material. Well, that would be terrific. But you know what? That's <laughs> not what, the That's really not why I'm doing this. I'm really doing this because uh, look, cause it's almost like a Hollywood movie with Cassini. Discovery after discovery was, yes, check this off for habitability on Celsius. Check that off, check that off, check that off. It went through the entire list and discovered all these things. And now it's time to go back there and actually look to see if it's not just a habitable environment, is it inhabited? Is there life? And that's really what's important, to be honest. Not a trip to Stockholm or whatever it is. Let's hope, let's hope we find something. I hope so too. Let's, it's, hope, it's, they it's like let's hope they fly us. Yes. That's the main <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, first, do you think it's gonna happen? I, I think that we have a really good chance, uh, but I will tell you that this is not the most conservative discovery mission. Just the fact that we are going to the outer solar system, we would be the first discovery mission to go to the outer solar system. So NASA has to be willing to take a risk. If you'd like to watch more videos about this new space age we live in, please subscribe.